Once there was an age when thousands around the world flocked to Nickelodeon parlors, theaters, and picture palaces to witness what was to them a new miracle. For this was the time of the birth of the cinema, the motion picture, the very beginning of the first truly mass entertainment industry. to think of large cities as extremely dangerous places to live in. Crime in the streets is a genuine concern for people who live in or visit some great metropolis. So it may be a consolation of sorts to look at movies that were made uh, in New York City very early in this century. Many of them were shot on location in the more dangerous parts of that city which, um, well, sections of it, even then, I remember when I was a kid growing up many years later, we were very carefully told to avoid. Um, they show these good, tough little films that criminal gangs were a feature of city life even then, and that they particularly preyed upon their closest neighbors, the poor, and that there was nothing colorful or romantic about poverty in those days either. But quite the most remarkable thing about these films is their, is their documentary quality. This is the way a great city, or at least those corners of it that um, so-called nice people rarely penetrated, really was. Quite aside from their dramatic values and their suspenseful storytelling, um, these pictures form an invaluable part of the historical record. They show how, well, how a lot of us really lived in an age now gradually being covered over with layers of false nostalgia. Before films existed, the terror and fascination that crime and vice imparted was popularized in the press and read avidly. Famous murderers filled the newspapers. This is Charles Peace, the English criminal who had killed the husband of a Mrs. Dyson and had also shot a policeman. After his execution in 1879, his image was preserved in the chamber of horrors of a wax museum, Madame Tussauds in London. Waxwork tableaus showed the lifelike scenes of murders before moving pictures were invented. It was as if the wax museums stored the bodies of the dead. Many of the heads that haunt Madame Tussauds were made by her as they came from the block of the guillotine during the French Revolution. Alongside these death-like masks, rests the waxwork's body of the sleeping beauty waiting to be kissed back to life. No wonder that waxworks have been described as motion pictures about to be born. Wax museums tried to breathe life into their creations. In New York on 23rd Street was the Eden Musée, a wax museum inspired by Madame Tussauds. It exhibited a similar collection of macabre figures. The Eden Musée was to become the first permanent home of the moving picture. On the 29th of June, 1896, it projected some of the first films ever made. It was here that Edwin S. Porter, the man who was to create the first story film, was employed as a projectionist. He saw the first films that were made by the Lumiere brothers in this museum. 
This film, The Death of Mara, was made by the Lumiere brothers in 1897. It was like waxworks brought to life. The same films generally reach a larger audience through the sideshows and fairgrounds and entertainment saloons. In Britain, for example, William Hagger, the actor and traveling showman, had been fascinated by motion pictures since... <laughs> it was just her way of exposing the system. ...began, like Porter, showing other people's films. By the end of the century, he was making his own films and touring parts of England and Wales. On April 5, 1891, he opened his traveling cinema, The Bioscope, on the fairground of Aberavon in Wales, among the sideshows, hooplas, and boxing booths. As he added his 15 pounds takings, he was heard by his daughter to say, I knew there was money in it. Only one of his films survives. The Life of Charles Peace, which was made in 1905. And so a sensational story and trial that was already 25 years old was recreated for the cinema as it had previously been in the Chamber of Horrors. Edwin S. Porter left the Eden Musée and was directing his own films for Edison by the turn of the century. In 1903, for showing in Nickelodeons and fun fairs, he directed a completely fictional drama, The Great Train Robbery. It had an enormous success. The story film was born. While gangster films are like westerns in the city, this was like a gangster film in the West. The great train robbery was widely copied to meet the demand for the new entertainment. The bold bank robbery was made the following year on the coattails of its success.
robbery itself never quite leaves the stage, but once the film enters the streets of Philadelphia and makes use of genuine urban settings, it takes on an authentic feel of actuality, of a news story captured on film, the feeling of crime in the streets of the city. The feeling of immediacy is created when the robbers are captured by the police with the help of a telegraph alert across the city. was the center of American filmmaking in the 1900s. Small-time film companies made short films for showing in converted shops and Nickelodeons. The urban and immigrant poor were the first audience for this cheap entertainment. At the Biograph Studios in Lower East Side, New York, the ex-actor David Wark Griffith, who had worked for Porter, had embarked on a series of great experimental films. The local streets provided the perfect location for crime films to be made. In 1912, he made The Musketeers of Pig Alley and created one of the most remarkable gangster pictures in the history of the cinema. A young violinist who is engaged to Lillian Gish has just earned some money. The gang leader sees this. violinist is mugged and loses his purse and, by implication, his fiancée, who is later found at a dance drinking with other men. confront each other in direct and blatant competition for the girl. The glove is down, the challenge is made, and the leaders organize their gangs. They trail each other from the dance hall through the streets and bars of New York.
Survival in the city involves a kind of struggle, and even the violinist realizes this. When the violinist recovers his purse, he also wins the girl. The gang leader's attempt to recapture the initiative with the girl has failed, and the actor, Elmer Booth, the screen's first gangster, accepts his defeat with bravura grace. The archetypal gangster is born. Filmmakers searched the city newspapers for sensational stories of crime and vice. Following the John D. Rockefeller report into prostitution, links between police corruption and white slavery became public knowledge. Prominent police officials were tried and convicted on charges of bribery and corruption. White slavery and prostitution became the subject of a rash of exploitation films. Police raids attempted to keep the New York cinemas respectable. In 1913, impresarios were building the first purpose-built theaters for the exhibition of the new feature-length films. Traffic in Souls was a crime film which completely reversed all the facts and evidence for the benefit of pure action drama. Earlier films had been advertised as having a dozen scenes. This sensational film of 1913 had 700. It was the first of the great expose films to deal with organized crime which threatened the fabric of society. the first of the films which simultaneously showed the police as incorruptible guardians of moral welfare. In a brilliantly conceived sequence, the police officer Burke leads a raid on a brothel to save his future sister-in-law from a fate worse than death. The stakeout, the feeling of a coordinated raid, is superbly staged. The city and its buildings are like an actor in the film. It is a film of the city, the home of the gangster film. 